Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. Connor Freeman joins us now. Connor, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. In, thank you, in Judge. Your, in your um, analysis of uh, what went on last weekend when the uh, Iranian government retaliated against Israel for the Israeli uh, destruction of its embassy, its consulate adjacent to the embassy in Damascus, its murder of uh, two generals and seven uh, civilians. You probably heard some of these arguments uh, about morality, that somehow it was moral for the Israelis uh, to attack the Iranians, but not moral for the Iranians to uh, fight back. David Cameron, the uh, prime minister, the, the former prime minister and now foreign minister of Great Britain, made those comments. We'll we'll play them for you again. Can can you unpack that argument for us, please? Well, uh, under the rules based uh, the inter the rules based international order, as uh, Anthony Blinken calls it, certain countries and certain people do not have rights, and they're not considered actual humans. Uh, if you look at uh, Syria, for instance, um, the sanctions regime has put 90% of the population below the poverty line. Israel bombs the country roughly every week. Um, we, I mean, they're blo they blow up repeatedly. The Damascus International Airport, the Aleppo International Airport, the Israelis have carried out assassinations of Iranian officials and scientists and aerospace engineers in Iran. Uh, especially throughout 2022, without any, uh, even a slap on the wrist from the Biden administration. They routinely, uh, covertly attack energy infrastructure, nuclear energy infrastructure in Iran, uh, which could of course, uh, have all kinds of devastating consequences. Uh, and, and this is even something that even the IAEA chief Rafael Grassi is warning about right now. He was too worried to send even his inspectors to nuclear facilities on Monday this week. Um, be, for fear, he said, we're always worried that Israel is going to attack Iran's nuclear facilities. And he repeated that Iran, we have not seen any evidence that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. So Israel essentially acts as a rogue state, and really so does the U.S. But in, I guess in the case of even the genocide in Gaza, there's really no moral... Uh, the, the certain people are subjected to certain, if you want to call them this, laws of morality that other countries are not. So when we say send in Nazis over the border into Russia to kill civilians and attack civilians, or or are we we complicit in it? That's really not a crime. But of course, Russia and their war against Ukraine is viewed as the ultimate evil. Um, even though we are using Ukraine as a human battering ram. So, it's all so very... The U.S. pretty much critical. makes up its own rules as it goes along and makes up rules uh, for others. Any other country doing in Gaza what the Israelis are doing, even the U.S. would acknowledge that it's genocide. But because the U.S. pays for it and pays for it under pressure from the uh, donor class that really has a vice grip on the U.S. government, it's not considered... Uh, genocide. It's not even considered uh, a war crime, and the president can condemn it all he wants, but he keeps paying for it. Precisely. And the Israeli, uh, the IDF, can occupy the West Bank and can occupy Gaza all at once. But Joe Biden will attack Vladimir Putin for occupying the eastern part of Ukraine, but will pay for Benjamin Netanyahu occupying Palestine. Absolutely. $3.8 so billion how dollars much, a year, how, at least. How, how much of this uh, free speech for me, but not for thee, uh, is going to go on? I, I really don't see any end in sight, Judge. I mean, uh, for instance, you know, the Isra again, uh, to your point, the Israelis, we, the American government makes much more of a stink about how women are treated in Iran than they do about Israel attacking or bombing 400 different health facilities in Gaza and killing 700 
or well, hundreds anyway, of um, they've killed 700 people in those attacks in the first five months of the war, according to the World Health Organization. But they've killed hundreds and hundreds of medical workers and doctors and nurses and uh, hundreds of aid workers, mostly working for the UN. They've tortured UN workers. They've raped UN workers. Uh, they are currently, um, you know, as you say, uh, as you're uh, alluding to, uh, demolishing thousands and thousands of buildings in the on the border with Israel in Gaza to create a so-called buffer zone. And they're currently stealing at least 16 percent of the land in Gaza. And we have, you know, members of the Knesset in the Jewish power party, Itmar Ben Gavir's party, the uh, you know, some of the heart, the worst hardliners talking about how we have secret plans. We're going to be resettling Gaza. We're going to be taking it back. It may happen in phases, unfortunately, but we're going to take Gaza. And um, and, you know, Benny Gantz, of course, is saying that this war is going to go on for years and years and years. And the plan is for an indefinite occupation. And that's been repeated. So, of course, the American position is, well, we don't want to see Israel taking any land from Gaza. Uh, we we have seen, but then of course, when they announce that that's exactly what they're doing, the Biden administration does nothing, sends thousands of more two thousand pound bombs, and salutes everything that Netanyahu is doing, despite the claims of frustration. Um, it's uh, hard to swallow, but our government is just as criminal and genocidal and venal as uh, the Israelis. Nicely put, criminal, genocidal, and venal. I mean, the Israeli government. Uh, is a criminal gang, and you're you're correct to quote Benny Gantz. I mean, Benny Gantz is tall, slim, nice looking, and likable, as opposed to Netanyahu, who was none of those. But in terms of the ferocity, it's the way God made him. But uh, in 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 terms of the ferocity of their policy, Gantz might actually be worse. I mean, when Gantz was the head of the IDF, the stuff that he did in Gaza, which was not covered even by us at the time. Uh, was as horrific as what uh, Netanyahu and his crew uh, are doing now. I think Netanyahu's days are numbered, but I don't think anything's going to change uh, with respect to Gaza unless a state actor enters, which brings us back to Ukraine. My understanding of what the Israelis did was to kill civilians and attack an embassy, a consulate adjacent to an embassy. Consulates and embassies are immune from attack even in wartime uh, under the Geneva Conventions to which the Israelis are sig signatories. They don't care. Of course. Uh, Iran attacked military sites. They did send hundreds and hundreds of drones. They were all aimed at military sites. The purpose of the drones was to force the Israelis to waste their defensive mechanisms by shooting down the drones and by doing them, revealing where the shooting down was coming from. They succeeded in doing that. That is, the, the Ukrainians now know where the Israeli defenses are, and the Israelis wasted $1.3 billion worth of ammunition in one night. Five missiles got through. They destroyed an intelligence headquarters, the headquarters that planned and plotted the attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, uh, and they rendered useless to, uh, to airfields. There is no moral equivalency. One was a targeted, let's not hurt civilian military attack. The other was, who cares about international law? Let's destroy the embassy. Let's kill the generals. And if anybody else gets killed, too bad. That's absolutely right. And also the Israelis gave the Iranians gave at least a 72 hour notice and have been right. telegraphing this attack for two weeks. At least they had let, definitely let the Turks and the Jordanians and the Iraqis uh, and I believe the Saudis as well know about the attack who they no doubt passed that information along to the United States. And so, of course, Israel knew about it probably for the same duration. And the as you say, they only targeted uh, military uh, sites. And they didn't kill anybody. Uh, they injured the one injury of the seven year old Bedouin girl in the Negev was a result of a, a shrapnel that came down from a missile that was intercepted. And in the case of the Iran, the bombing of the Iranian consulate, civilians were killed in that. And it was uh, seven IRGC officials, including uh, General Mohammad Reza Zahedi, uh, the top Quds Force commander for operations in Lebanon and Syria, and his deputy. And so this was a absolute declaration of war against Iran. And 
the Iranians actually, there's been reports that they actually said to the Americans in these back channel communications, if you push for a ceasefire, then we will not respond here to the Israelis. And they also said that if the UN Security Council would condemn the attack on the Iranian consulate, which is a flagrant violation of international law, uh, virtually unprecedented, they still, the Americans, the British, and the French did not, and they're shameless, and they continue to lie in support of this genocide. And of course, we're seeing what it's reaping, which is a, a larger regional war with the axis of resistance, which is led by the Quds Force, led by Iran. Uh, and so, and this is Benny Gantz's plan. Actually, Benny Gantz announced earlier, I believe during when Naftali Bennett was still prime minister, that the goal of the uh, really the Abraham Accords project was to build a NATO style coalition encircling Iran for a future war. And of course, that's not going to happen now, especially because Israel has isolated itself so much in the region. Uh, the only Arab state that helped them intercept any of these uh, projectiles coming through were the Jordanians. Otherwise, they had to rely on the Americans, the British, and the French. It's not much of a regional coalition. Um, and so uh, what we're seeing now is, of course, a this is resulting from Biden's just unconditional support for Netanyahu. And I fear that at this point, politically, Biden cannot use his leverage. I mean, it's encouraging slightly that he's saying we will not support offensive operations against Iran, but at the same time, they're pledging ironclad support and actually promoting, Judge, the bombing of the consulate. Uh, we've seen uh, a senior Biden administration official tell reporters that the way they're framing it to the Israelis and to the public is, you really got off a win here. You wiped out the Quds Forced uh, leadership in the Levant. And, and then you defended against these strikes and you've shown how superior you are militarily. And so you got to win. So don't escalate further. Just take this one and, uh, and, 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 you know, basically give yourself a pat on the back and continue with your genocide. But they're, uh, they're, they're applauding Israel now for this bombing of the Iranian consulate. It's just disgraceful. And again, Here. it just shows that the U.S. completely acts outside international law. This has been the case my whole lifetime. We've killed millions of people in this region, and it looks like uh, at this rate, uh, there'll be millions more killed if the U.S. goes to war with Iran, which is clearly Netanyahu's goal. It is Netanyahu's goal. I don't know if uh, Joe Biden is foolish enough to fall into that. Here's um, uh, Foreign Minister Cameron. So this is cut number nine, Sonia, not 10 yet, just nine. Uh, what about Iran's frustration at part of its sovereign territory being flattened? Well, I would argue there is a, a massive degree of difference between what Israel did in Damascus and, as I said, 301 weapons being launched by the state of Iran at the state of Israel. For the first time, a state-on-state -state attack, 101 ballistic missiles, 36 cruise missiles, 185 drones. That is a degree of difference. Yeah. And I think a reckless and dangerous thing for Iran to have done. And I think the whole world can see all these countries that have somehow wondered, well, you know, what is the true nature of Iran? It's there okay. in black and white. Now she follows up with what would the British do if one of their embassies was demolished? What would Britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates? Well, we would take, uh, we, you know, we would take the very strong action. And Iran would say that that's what they did? Well, what they did, as I said, was a so massive they, attack. So they, they were, were right think, to respond, but they overreacted, is well, that what you're I, saying? I'm, what I'm saying they is that the, right atta the, attack, the attack they carried out was on a very large scale, much bigger than but people they accepted. they have a right to respond? Well, countries have a right to respond. He was a mediocre uh, prime minister, and he's a terrible uh, foreign minister, who obviously has a political uh, a political motive here. I'll let you comment on it before we move over to Ukraine. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't hear. He's just an abs. I, I was on mute by accident. He he is just an absolute liar. Uh, the Iran the Israelis have attacked the Natanz nuclear facility in Isfahan repeatedly, the main center for building centrifuges. They have carried out assassinations, as I said, of uh, repeatedly using the MEK uh, 
terrorist cult in uh, the Mujahideen cult uh, in uh, Iran to kill uh, for, um, uh, Colonel Hassan Syed Koday in Tehran in his driveway. They just machine gunned him to death. And then they carried out drone strikes on various military sites inside Iran. Um, this is just a, com I mean, and also Israel, I mean, I mean, excuse me, also Syria, we have seen Israel bomb civilian infrastructure, civilian areas, bomb Damascus, bomb uh, Iran. It's what they call Iranian targets, but it's very often the Syrian Arab army that they're bombing. And these are very these. The Wall Street Journal reported in June of 2022 that these mo many of these strikes, if not a majority, are cleared with and coordinated with the Pentagon and Central Command before they take place. So the U.S. is absolutely complicit in this. And of course, you know, I mean. Uh, this is the first state on state. I mean, he it's it's incredible. They basically just pretend that Israel is not guilty of any crimes. They can attack anyone at will. And there, I, the the impression is that Israel is completely above the law and that these other people are just scum and just I, I don't know, they're 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 allowed to you're allowed to bomb Iran, you're allowed to bomb Syria, Lebanon, you're allowed to kill all these aid workers and civilians and women and children. And it's just, you know, as long as Israel's doing it, it's just self-defense. And it's just absolutely atrocious. But he's just outright lying there. There so have we're been transitioning to um to Ukraine. Is Ukraine on its deathbed? Well, I mean, we've seen half a million people killed, if not, uh, or injured so severely they can't return to the battlefield. The average age of a Ukrainian soldier now is at least 43. Uh, the They've lost 20% of their territory. The uh, There's all kinds of reports coming out now suggesting that the military is on the uh, brink of collapse. I mean, uh, that some of the top officers in the Ukrainian military told Politico about two weeks ago that the front line at virtually every point is at risk of collapsing anytime Russia pushes forward with an offensive on any part of the front line. And they're expecting a major Russian offensive here in uh, later in the spring or in early summer. And we hear you know, quotes from officials saying we don't have the technology to repel the large numbers of troops that the Russians are going to throw at us. And the Americans and the, the rest of the NATO alliance don't have the weapons in sufficient quantities to defend us either. The, uh, you know, the Ukrainians have depleted their air defenses. The Russians are uh, increasingly attaining better intelligence and are really hitting the energy uh, infrastructure in Ukraine uh, much more strongly. They just took out the largest power plant, uh, the ther I believe it's the Triplitskia uh, thermal plant in the Kiev region. And so, uh, and in the meantime, all the Ukrainians seem to be able to do is send over these drone attacks and these artillery attacks and these uh, militias to go into civilian areas over the border. Uh, and they don't really make a big impact on the the actual uh, war itself, but it does escalate uh, the conflict because every time they attack inside Russia or they attack the Kerch Bridge, for instance, there is always a, a massive response from the Russians against what civilian would you? What what would you do if uh, the Speaker of the House called you up and said, uh, Connor, give me the argument against the $61 billion. I mean, these people think that $61 billion is somehow going to change the war. We know the $40 billion of it is going to stay here, but I'll let you take uh, that argument. Put aside tell that the Republicans stand for nothing. Put aside that this Speaker is about to lose his job, that Thomas Massey is a, is a hero, and the Speaker is just doing Joe Biden's bidding. This is absurd that we should waste another 61 billion, is it not? Absolutely. And I would just tell him to call the head of Euro Command, call the uh, he's the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO for crying out loud. He just told Congress last week that Russia's uh, military is 15 percent larger than it was before the invasion, that they're on track to having the largest military on the entire uh, continent of Europe, that they're more lethal and stronger than they've ever been, and that the uh they you know even kurt campbell the number two at the state department has said that russia has uh, virtually completely reconstituted its military meaning that all of this nonsense we've heard from these hawks like mitt romney and richard blumenthal about how oh we've destroyed russia's military capacity by a half it's just a, a complete lie they they have they have uh, any kind of damage that was sustained according to the top officials in the military and the State Department. They're saying that is not the case, that they have uh, that the, the, the damage at this point is almost negligible. And 
in the meantime, they've completely outstripped the entire NATO alliance in terms of producing artillery uh, by at least three times. Um, and so there's just no way that they can... I mean, the only thing they can do, I mean, this is why we're hearing more talk from these European, uh, these hawkish European uh, states, like, uh, well, from Macron, uh, most importantly, saying that he's going to, he's thinking about sending troops to Ukraine. Well, you only would do that if you believe that the war is is completely lost and that the the, in, the Ukrainian regime is on the brink of a collapse. And uh in the meantime, we're still on the brink of nuclear war. We've, and apparently, you know, according to the Office of Management and of the Budget, w the spending on the war is fourteen billion dollars greater than was initial than was originally admitted. We've spent over one hundred and twenty billion dollars now. If you spend another sixty, it gets up to about one hundred and eighty-five billion dollars. They're only doing it for politics, and you and we're talking about hundreds of thousands do of you, Ukrainians who have died. It's just do you it's think that the do you think the neocons who uh, pushed uh, for this and who have uh, surrounded Joe Biden uh, know that this has been a dismal failure and now we're concentrating on Israel? Or do they not have a reverse? Do they not have remorse? Do they never acknowledge when they're wrong? They want blood and they got it. I think it's unfortunately likely to be the latter. The uh you know they have the sunk cost fal uh, fallacy. They they really do believe that if they just bleed Russia anyway, it's worth it. Uh, in fact, you know when they when they sent the Ukrainians in for that counteroffensive last summer, it's been it was we knew from the Discord leaks from uh, uh, Jack Teixeira's leaks, uh, and we knew from actually subsequent reporting after the counteroffensive had begun uh, in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the other major papers that they absolutely knew. The Ukrainians did not have the equipment that they needed from artillery to, to planes to air defenses. And they sent them in there anyway. And they said, we uh, expect high numbers of casualties, but we expect the Ukrainians to accept that as the price of pushing through Russia's defenses. And then when they couldn't do that, they and, and tens of thousands of, of Ukrainians were getting killed or gravely wounded. Uh, the re response from American officials in the press was the Ukrainians are just too casualty averse. And of course, we've heard rhetoric from Lindsey Graham, who is essentially a spokesman for the neoconservatives. He's he's just furious that the that some of the Ukrainians are trying to avoid fighting in this war, this unwinnable war, which the majority of the public empathizes with people who are, who are dodging the draft or trying to anyway. Uh, he says and he said that he wants them to fight to the last Ukrainian. I really like how this works. We provide the money. We provide the weapons and you fight to the last Ukrainian, even if it means you're fighting hand to hand. And this is, you know, the, the policy is to weaken Russia as much as possible, uh, as I mentioned before on the show, in, in, in anticipation of this future war with China. Uh, but I don't see them really ending this or negotiating, at least not until, you know, we could see a different calculus after the election. But in the meantime, we're talking about at least through November or even early next year, where there's not going to be any thought of diplomacy um, with Russia. And in the meantime, we're only going up the escalation ladder and closer and closer to nuclear war. And we're already closer than we've ever been. Connor Freeman. Thank you, my dear uh, man. Your, uh, your knowledge of all this is encyclopedic and you're very generous to uh, share it with us. We'll see you again soon. Thank you very much, judge. Take care. Of course. Coming up at uh, three o'clock Eastern, the great Phil Giraldi, and at 4 o'clock Eastern, the intrepid Aaron Matei, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.